Okay, thank you very much uh, to Jamie and to the BHI uh, for this invitation. And um, I'm really glad to see everyone here. We're on our uh, second ice storm of the week um, where I am. And so this is uh, extremely fun to be able to do um, since, since I'm not going outside. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to be talking about today, and um, this is going to move fairly fast, um, but what, what I'm going to be talking about are catalogs of scientific results as a basis for inference and testing. Um, what I'm going to be looking at in particular um, is the search for the cosmic microwave background and for uh, gravitational wave backgrounds um, radiation. And um, we're going to get to catalogs toward the end, but the hope is that by that point, you'll see um, what the point is of, of referring to catalogs and reports of results in particular. Um, as sort of engines for theory testing. But let me um, get to an outline of what we're going to be talking about. Um, the talk will be focused on, again, the search for the gravitational wave and cosmic microwave background. Um, and we'll be looking at a series of problems or challenges um, that are faced. Um, among them are parameter degeneracy, uh, issues of statistical inference, and questions about models. Um, we're going to be focusing especially on misspecification in statistical models and um, possible fundamental bias in theory models. Um, then we're going to be focusing on some cool new research into um, the non-Gaussian uh, elements of the background, and then concluding with the promised discussion of catalogs and maps. But I need to move quickly if we're going to get there, so I'll move, move on from this. So again, we're focusing on the search for background radiation. Um, here, I just want to mention briefly, um, and I can't focus on this, one aspect of the history uh, is the search for relic gravitational waves. Um, and this is something that is found in the work of Leonid Grischuk, uh, which I just want to mention because um, he passed away uh, just a couple of years ago. And if you look up his work, there's um, very interesting information there about the development of the search for the gravitational wave background. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things about this before we move in. Um, the fundamental observable in searching for the gravitational wave background in particular is polarization because there's a different polarization for gravitational wave background than for cosmic microwave background. Um, so B mode polarization is used as an indication of the gravitational wave background. This, um, uh, there's a recent paper from Ben Thorne. <laughs> um, everyone, when they cite this paper, they they point out that it's Ben Thorne for obvious reasons um, and, and collaborators in 2017. Um, and so it seems as if, okay, great, there's a, um, there's a clear indicator of when there's gravitational wave background and when there isn't. Um, this is kind of good news. Um, but there's also some bad news, which is that uh, the gravitational wave background has proven very difficult to detect. Um, there are tons of confounding factors. Um, some of those actually include noise. Um, so noise in the instruments and noise from um, confounding parameters. Um, there's been amazing work if you're interested in, in this kind of um, sort of instrumentation and, and noise reduction. Um, there's been amazing work in LIGO, Virgo, Virgo and CAGRA. Um, and they've reported it recently in correlating measurements of the gravitational wave background from multiple detectors and observing runs. Um, so one way of sort of reducing noise in the measurements is to include, include um, methods for cross-correlation and data comparison, because if you can show, this is a, a, a sort of standard technique for robustness and reliability, if you can show that the same signal is present in distinct detectors, then unless you, there's also an argument that the exact same noise was there, this is a um, sort of reinforcement of the reliability of the signal. Um, so cross-correlation of different detectors can reduce the influence of noise on detection, especially once. Um... Okay, so we were talking about <laughs> we were talking about technical challenges, um, and one of them is um, and and so we're going to be talking briefly about uh, three three potential types of challenges in um, the search for background radiation: physical ones, parameter degeneracy. Um, and uncertainty in the measurements. Um, and then we'll be looking at various types of statistical fixes or, or um, inference types that might be used to try to control the parameters. Um, so for instance, flat priors, uh, Jeffrey's priors um, used in statistical inference. Um, and then we'll be looking also at um, methods, other methods of looking at the data and um, inference from them, 
um, for instance, model validation and testing, including testing models for um, misspecification or bias. Um, so first, let's look at parameter degeneracy and uncertainty. So this is a, this is a, a known uh, question. There's been quite a bit of recent work on this. Um, there are many parameters involved in measurements of the gravitational wave background and the CMB. Um, measurement of one may in interfere with measurement of another. There may be other versions of degeneracy. Um, I'm citing here, this is just sort of a review paper um, about various different types of parameter degeneracies that I found very helpful. Um, Wayne uh, Hu at, um, uh, has, has also recently pointed out, um, and this is again something that's known, that the gravitational wave background itself can function as a uh, sort of parameter that suppresses the uh, cosmic microwave, sorry, that should be M not W, um, power spectrum at high multiples. And so, um, in fact, you can find degeneracy even among the measurements of, of, of uh, the two types of background. Um, and this is from Wayne Hugh, um, and, and uh, this is just actually from his website. Um, as a consequence of parameter degeneracy, there's often no definitive answer as to how well experiment X will measure parameter Y. It depends on what parameters you think are reasonable to vary and how. Um, many reasonable cosmologists will tell you that the gravitational waves are probably so small in amplitude that you can ignore them entirely when measuring the cosmic background. Um, and Hugh points out many seemingly conflicting statements in the CMB literature can be resolved if you look at what the implicit assumptions of the authors were, um, this is going to be important um, moving forward. I also just want to mention one brief point, um, and I had a nice picture of Nancy Agarwal, but it's not coming through. But this is just, I'm just mentioning it because it's cool new work um, in the search for the gravitational wave background and the CMB quantum uncertainty can affect measurement. And there's some very cool new science being done on quantum squeezing. Um, that is uh, helping with that, with that uncertainty in the measurements, but that's not gonna be a focus of what we're looking at. Um, so there's a potential way, uh, there are various potential ways of sort of dealing with or fixing um, parameter degeneracy and uncertainty. So one way is to look at sort of a rigorous or robust way of um, uh, analyzing the data after observation. So one way is to use um, flat priors which are commonly used in Bayesian inference. And um, the aim of a flat prior is actually to be uninformative. <laughs> um, and we can talk about this in detail later if uh, people are interested, but basically this could be seen as a way to address parameter degeneracy. Um, so we assume nothing um, when in post-data analysis, we assume nothing about a given parameter. We assume that we didn't maybe even counterfactually assume we didn't know anything about a given parameter when testing its presence and influence on a system. Um, but there are important problems, known problems with flat priors. Um, a flat prior, for instance, doesn't always mean a prior that's invariant under functions of a parameter. Um, this is, again, this is a well-known um, issue in inference. Uh, I'm just citing from a recent book, but there's tons of work on this. A uniform distribution for a given parameter theta doesn't generally imply a uniform distribution for functions of theta. Um, so this is a problem for using flat priors. So there's a potential fix for flat priors. We could use Jeffrey's priors. Um, so in a 1946 paper, Harold Jeffries tries to solve this problem of uh, the lack of invariance of flat priors under functions with the so-called Jeffries prior, um, log uniform prior. Um, it's invariant to reparameterization. In other words, it doesn't change given one-to-one -one transformations or functions of the parameter theta. Um, so interestingly, um, the LIGO collaborative, from what I've been able to see from recent reports, and I'd be interested to hear um, uh, if anyone knows more about this, um, seems to use flat priors most of the time. Um, so there's a paper, uh, Neil Cornish and, and uh, collaborators, including uh, Chatsoyanu and others uh, who work on the probability side of LIGO, have a recent uh, forthcoming paper on the most recent version of Bayes wave. And they report that they use flat priors for most intrinsic and extrinsic parameters, except for the wavelet amplitude. Um, but, and this is, I just find this interesting, um, they use Jeffrey priors, Jeffrey's priors in the search for the gravitational wave background. So there's a very recent paper on upper limits on the isotropic GWB from uh, the third observing run. And they actually give a footnote to Jeffrey's 1946 paper introducing the log uniform prior. Um, so I think this might actually be um, 
kind of informative of the fact that um, since it's so well known that there's parameter degeneracy, parameter difficulties um, with the search for the background radiation, it may be that you know the Jeffries prior is being used here as a sort of additional uh, additional source of control in the inference. But I have no I, d I have no evidence for that. I just know that there's this difference. Um, but it's important to note that even the use of Jeffries priors doesn't do away altogether with the problem of uninformative priors in inference. Um, so in this book called The Bugs Book, it's a book about Bayesian inference. Um, there's a nice summary of it. Um, if the specific form of vague prior you're using is influential in the analysis, this strongly suggests you have insufficient data to draw a robust conclusion based on the data alone, and you shouldn't be trying to be non-informative in the first place. I think that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, now, let me note that I'm not saying that this is, this is a problem inherent to anyone in particular's um, methods of inference, but simply that um, if we're trying to sort of deal with various problems of parameter degeneracy and determinacy or uncertainty, um, sometimes the use of flat or Jeffries priors can help, and sometimes you need to sort of go deeper and look at the statistical model, the physical model, look at um, the, the sort of deeper and more robust elements of the inference. Um, so in particular, uh, one way to look at, uh, one way to analyze the data is to move to a more robust statistical summary of what's gone on in the observing runs. Um, so there are, for instance, well-known summaries of results using probability distributions or matrices. For instance, the Fisher matrix, the posterior probability, variance, covariance matrices. And these can simplify very complex data. Um, and beyond simplification, we might want to use a statistical summary to report what's been observed so far and the impact of those observations or the data on the probability of a given model or set of parameters, right? Um, yeah, you, can, you can't see those pictures, can you? Darn. Um, let me see if I can, never mind. All right, actually, as it so happens, this is one of the pictures. <laughs> Um, is a recent book um, by Tiziana Di Matteo, Andrew King, and Neil Cornish. Um, and the other picture is a summary of the, um, basically it's a summary of the use of the um, posterior distribution um, as a way of giving a statistical summary of the, um, the evidence and the, the model evidence and um, every, everything statistically that we can say about the model H that's gleaned from the data. Um, so basically, let me read this out to you since you can't see it. Um, so Cornish is going to say the posterior distribution, the probability of theta with respect to data and the model H, um, and the model evidence, the probability of the data with respect to H, summarize everything about the model H that can be gleaned from the data. Um, the posterior distribution can be used to compute point estimates for each parameter, such as the mean, median, and mode, as well as credible intervals for one or more parameters. Um, and then he gives you know, the mean value and so forth. This should be, I mean, I know everyone knows what a posterior distribution is, but the, the point here is simply that um, this is a way the posterior can actually be used as a kind of uh, summary, statistical summary of the evidence that's yielded from observing runs so far and as a means of comparison. Um, so the posterior is one uh, sort of well-known way of doing this. Um, the posterior probability includes information about the data and about the model used. It's then used to find point estimates for each parameter. This can determine the maximum a posteriori values, which are often supposed to coincide with maximum likelihood estimates. So one nice thing about this is that it kind of combines um, frequentist and, and Bayesian methods of inference because the likelihood and, and uh, MAP values are often considered to coincide. Um, so these summaries are therefore supposed to give us a simple and sort of effective summary of the statistical information that's available about each parameter. Um, but there are some, again, there are some uh, questions that have been raised about these uses of um, statistical summaries and certain uh, methods of inference. So probabilistic summaries report on inferences that can be made given a model, given a particular model. Um, they don't necessarily probe the assumptions that have been made and the model dependencies of the data and the inferences. Um, so I actually did not know this um, until I got sort of halfway into this paper, but um, Michaela Massimi has a very recent 2021 paper in the European Journal for Philosophy of Science on um, issues for Bayesian inference in the search for dark energy. 
Um, so she's going to raise some very similar uh, questions to those I'm about to raise um, about the use of priors and Bayesian inference in the um, summary of data, but in a very different, in a somewhat different context, um, namely the search for dark energy. Um, so one point that I want to make is that while there's there are obviously very um, strong reasons to to want uh, to have statistical or probabilistic summaries of the data along these lines, they don't necessarily present an epistemically complete account of the state of the field. Um, they're not necessarily supposed to. They're supposed to be simple and uh, uh, flexible and so forth. Um, but the reason that they don't uh, necessarily is because they don't always pick up on the physical and statistical assumptions, um, the various forms of theory or model dependence of the results that are embedded in the model. Um, they don't, for instance, report on possible misspecification of the underlying statistical model or possible theoretical or model bias in the physical model. Um, so here, um, Eris Fanos, uh, recently in a paper called Misspecification Testing in Retrospect, um, is going to summarize the problem in the statistical case, um, or a problem sort of similar to what I'm bringing up. Um, and this is in the statistical case, the problem of misspecification arises when certain assumptions invoked by a statistical inference procedure are invalid. So this might include, for instance, the idea that um, underlying, an underlying distribution is normal in IID, um, when in fact it isn't. Um, if, you've, if you've made a mistake there, all of your uh, statistical inferences are going to be wrong, right? You're going to get the estimator wrong. You're going to get all of your predictions wrong. Um, and as a result, the reliability of an inference procedure is often undermined. So statistical misspecification can cause problems for statistical inference. Um, you can get you can get the mean and the variance and so forth wrong if you've if you've gotten the shape of the underlying distribution wrong, right? So this is the problem of misspecification, or at least one of them. Um, but there's also uh, what we might call physical misspecification or substantive. And Spanos is very careful, and I want to um, be as well um, to to distinguish these um, substantive from statistical. Um, but a physical model may display what's sometimes called model bias, model dependency, or fundamental bias. So here I often refer to recent work from Franz Pretorius and Nicolas Yunus. Um, so a simple example of this that everyone, everyone, everyone knows, um, the assumption in Ptolemaic astronomy that planetary orbits were circular. Um, ellipse, elliptical um, data was explained using epicycles or other forms of approximation rather than proposing a new fundamental model of planetary motion. I know that's uh, a ridiculous oversimplification of the history, but this is a simplified example just to get an idea of what's going on. Um, so for instance, here's where we get to the non-Gaussian models. Um, most models of the cosmic microwave background and also of the gravitational wave background assume that it follows a Gaussian distribution. Um, so, for instance, the Planck collaboration ha uh, has done a lot of the pioneering work on um, mapping the CMB, and in both their low and high multiple methods, um, for instance, in the commander statistical model for the posterior distribution, um, they assume that the cosmic microwave background follows a Gaussian distribution. Um, and this is a very, very recent paper um, reporting on the Planck 2018 results in which um, in section 2 and section 3.1, they go through the low and high multiple methods respectively and argue that they both um, follow a Gaussian distribution. Um, the assumption that the CMB and the GWB are Gaussian are, is embedded deep in and crucial to the models. Um, and this I want to point out involves both statistical and physical assumptions and inferences. So first of all, the current models again of the CMB and the GWB assume that they're Gaussian. Um, this is what allows them to be considered to be fully characterized by a spectral energy density. So let me just point out, this is also a reason why if, um, if fundamental phenomena are found to be non-Gaussian, it's going to be a huge pain, <laughs> but that's kind of separate from the epistemic issue. Um, so this is a statistical assumption that the underlying distribution is Gaussian. Um, also, there's some beautiful mathematics that's done mathematical physics um, using um, estimating the multiple moments using spherical harmonics. Um, and there's some, again, there's some really beautiful mathematical models here. Um, these make sense only under assumptions of rotational symmetry and Gaussian distribution, right? So um, this is a more sort of physical or mathematical aspect. 
Um, third, the assumption of Gaussianity is consistent with general predictions from the inflationary paradigm. And here I'm quoting from a recent um, report of results by uh, Thomas Boucher. I'm just based on the fact that he's a French institution, I'm pronouncing it that way. I, I, if someone can correct me, I don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm wrong, I think. Um, Martin France and Frank Steiner um, have a recent blog post called Is the CMB Gaussian that's reporting on recent work of theirs. And so I'm going to be focusing on that in, uh, over the next couple of slides. Um, and this is the link to this. Um, so we might think, so, so basically, let me, let me go back to the last slide for a second. Um, the assumption that, so, so basically, like the assumption or hypothesis that uh, the radiation is Gaussian, um, in most cases, at least for the primary anis anisotropies, um, sorry, I have a terrible time pronouncing that word, um, is, is going to be embedded deeply in the physical model as well as in the mathematical model. Um, but it's also going to be uh, consistent with uh, the inflationary paradigm and with the with with certain physical um, reasoning about you know ionization and so forth. Um, and so, but on the other hand, um, there are some people who think that there has been recent uh, observational data found that's inconsistent with the idea of the Gaussian distribution. And so the next few slides, I'm going to be talking about um, what do we do if there's, it's a, it's a well-known question in philosophy of science, what do you do, and, and in science, right? Um, it, what do you do if you find, um, if you make observations that are inconsistent with some assumption of the background theory or model? So one way that we might go would be what I might call naive or unsophisticated falsificationism. Um, so we might think that, uh, okay, well, we've found data or observations that are inconsistent with some set of hypotheses or assumptions of the model. And so then we should remove those hypotheses or, or change them. Um, so then we would follow this kind of flow chart that's well known. It's a, again, it's a kind of naive falsificationism. We make a set of assumptions or hypotheses HN associated with a model or theory. Data is observed that's inconsistent with one or more of these. Um, so we target H1 or H2, let's say, um, for removal. So we say, okay, we found inconsistent evidence for this. And so now we're going to remove these assumptions. And then we test the new model, which is H minus H1 and H2 against the data, right? So now we have a new more parsimonious model minus these errors or, or inconsistent assumptions. Um, interestingly, uh, Boucher, France, and Steiner seem to be taking a quite distinct path. Um, and so I want to say something about how they move forward with this. So first I'll just sketch out their procedure and then I'll say something more in, in detail about what, what exactly they do. Um, so their procedure is more like this. So we make assumptions or hypotheses HN, right? That's the same. And then we observe data that's inconsistent with one or more of these. So let's say H1 was the assumption of Gaussianity of the radiation and we find inconsistent data um, or some observation that seems inconsistent. We now need to know, and three and four are going to be very different, what non-Gaussianity would look like in the regime of interest. And so we build a trial new model, like a tentative testing model, um, to detect departures from the Gaussian assumption. So we say, what would it look like if this da underlying data, in fact, were not Gaussian, and what would we be able to infer? So in fact, we come up with, instead of deleting stuff from the model, we come up with a kind of tentative or prospective new model. And then we test the new assumption of non-Gaussianity against the data. And as we build a library of post-data analyses, we compare them to the existing models and the existing data. Okay, so um, here, uh, Boucher et al, or Boucher or whatever, uh, um, argue that a couple of things. Um, they say they're aiming to critically examine model dependencies in the analysis of non-Gaussian uh, radiation. And here they construct discrepancy functions to measure drifts from Gaussianity, it's a beautiful way of putting it, um, for the PDF and for the complete set of three Minkowski functionals. Um, these functionals provide a robust set of morphological descriptors, which supersedes the power of correlation analyses. And then they give Hermite expansions uh, for the discrepancy functions um, that have been shown to hold under very uh, general conditions, even for large deviations from Gaussian behavior. Now, um, I'm not going to be able to explain exactly what's going on here, but the idea behind this is that there's some beautiful mathematical physics being done that's, that's going to, um, that is aimed to detect 
drifts or deviations from the Gaussian assumptions and to be able to actually measure what's going on, right, um, in a systematic way. So um, the, the sort of general distinction that I'm trying to motivate here is we might have, again, a kind of naive falsificationism um, where we say, well, if observations are made uh, with, that are inconsistent with assumptions of our, of our model or theory, then we just remove them. We just target them for removal. Um, and the sort of richer testing perspective is that, well, no, we don't just remove uh, those assumptions from the model, we enrich uh, the overall framework, build a kind of perspective or tentative model um, that allows for identifying and measuring um, discrepancies from the underlying assumption that's being tested. Um, and here, one of the things that I just want to point out quickly is that this also allows for model comparison, right? This allows for a sort of broader sense of um, cases in which we might be able to compare the sort of background model with, um, with the new testing model. Um, so interestingly, there's an interesting result that, uh, that Boucher et al. find. They found that they compared it, and here finally we get to maps, they compared it with the results of the standard concordance model based on uh, 100,000, I guess, approximately sky maps. And they find that a standard model of inflation, the hierarchical ordering or HO model, is not as good a fit to this data as their non-Gaussian model. Um, they also found a stable signature of small non-Gaussianity in the ensemble of map realizations, despite the Gaussian assumption that underlies the very construction of those exact maps. And they argue this calls for systematic further analyses to disentangle the various secondary effects that go into the production of the maps. So here, um, probing departures from the statistical and physical model assumptions in the case of this research, the non-Gaussian, uh, probing the non-Gaussianities, has led to the necessity of systematic analysis of map and catalog construction and how it is kind of connected to observation and inference. So here I just want to uh, move out briefly, and I know I, I want to finish quickly, even though we had a um, sort of a break there in the beginning. Um, I still want to wrap up fairly quickly so that we can talk. Um, there's various ways that we might find to sort of summarize the data um, of observing runs um, in order to not only summarize it, but also um, build broader uh, frameworks for comparison and analysis. So one way is to give probabilistic summaries of the data and results, probability distributions, likelihoods, associated graphs and charts, right? Another way is to uh, produce maps, um, which might include simulations of what a radiation distribution looks like under certain model assumptions given the observations so far. Another way, which is uh, very much used by LIGO and, and others, um, are catalogs of observing runs that assemble data models and parameter value estimates and likelihoods that then give catalogs of the systems that were observed. Um, one way of looking at maps and catalogs um, in particular that I want to just um, focus on briefly is we might look at them as reports of results that are backed up by secure and certain inferences from data. So we might say that maps and catalogs are the written up or visual results of rigorous scientific work and they're sort of confirmed and they're right and, and so forth. Um, another way of looking at maps and catalogs though that I want to sort of um, encourage in concluding is as a rich framework for testing and counterfactual investigation, right? This is a lot of data that's, that's sort of embedded in um, maps of the underlying CMV and GWB and also in, in catalogs of sort of observing runs from LIGO, Virgo, Cagra, et cetera. Um, and I wanna point out that this, this data is just there, right? It's, it's, it's available for um, post-data analysis and it's a rich set of, I mean, everybody, that's what it's for, right? It's, it's there in order to allow for further investigation. Um, and Boucher, France, and Steiner test their reasoning about possible departures from the Gaussian model against the existing catalogs and maps, which turn out in this case to be a rich existing resource. They're able to, to make inferences based on their testing against the maps. Um, and I just want to point out um, that there are assumptions made in the models and searches for the gravitational wave background that are similar to those questioned by uh, Bouchard and his colleagues, um, whether or not the radiation is isotropic, um, isotropic, sorry, whether or not it's Gaussian, this exact same assumption uh, is, is very important there, um, the polarization and the stationarity of the radiation, right? These are all, um, these are all assumptions that are made in, in models um, more or less supported by the data, 
Um, but these are all assumptions or hypotheses that can be tested and investigated. Um, and I want to just uh, point out that the LIGO, Virgo, and Cogra collaboratives already report not only the data that they observe, but data that they searched for under, for instance, assumptions that differ from general relativity. So the recent report of the observing runs, uh, the first three observing runs includes um, uh, that kind of inference. There are, I, in, in terms of uh, sort of what, what sometimes people call inherency, um, there are also already frameworks for distinguishing between isotropic and anisotropic GWB radiation, um, which is itself a rich area of research. So in all of these searches for background radiation, um, frameworks could be built to explore the possibility that observations and catalogs depart from model assumptions in multimodal ways. This to me is a relatively computationally cheap way to get the most from the data from the observations that have already been made. Um, as well as embedding model assumptions, summaries of results um, could build broad frameworks for comparing um, different models or different ways that the models might depart from each other. Um, so here I just wanna make in closing, a, just a, a quick distinction here between falsification and testing methods the sort of naive falsificationist methodology I'm, I'm arguing against is aiming to target claims that are inconsistent with observed data. And I wanna argue that richer testing methods involve building broader comparative frameworks that are robust enough to detect and measure discrepancies and to model what different kinds of deviation from the theory or model being tested might look like. And here, um, catalogs and maps that are already existing can be crucial sources of consistency testing, correlation, and comparison of data in this context. So thanks very much. Okay, well, we have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, so if you could use the raise hand function um, for new questions, and if you have a um, a follow-up or a finger, then perhaps just send me a chat message so that I, I know to sort of slide you into the queue. Um, okay, uh, Ramesh? Uh, yeah, so somewhere along the way you said that I think it was the CMB, they made a mock catalog from Gaussian model and then analyzed it and it said that Gaussian is not consistent. Right, and that to me is a is a weird result because if you make a model and you know you set it up to be Gaussian, how can the analysis say it is not? It means that the analysis method is wrong, or what did the authors decide? Yeah, so so it was interesting. Um, they they so th these were the the researchers testing non Gaussianity. And so they were actually looking for non-Gaussian phenomena. And so it's kind of unfair, right? So they were looking through the catalog for non-Gaussian results and they found that. Um, what they were arguing was kind of the, um, the, the point that even though the map was generated using the assumption that the phenomena were Gaussian, they were able to detect discrepancies um, they were able to detect potentially non-Gaussian um, uh, radiation in that map. So that's, that was what they thought was interesting was that they were able to detect potentially non-Gaussian um, distributions even in uh, a catalog that had been sort of constructed using the assumption of Gaussian distribution. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, uh, maybe a little follow-up. Maybe I yes. misunderstood because this catalog that they have constructed? Is it from real data or is it a mock catalog from uh, an idealized model? Yeah, this is okay. I need to look, I need to look this up. This was, um, they, they argued that this was a search of all the available CMB maps. I then start to wonder, and this is exactly what's, uh, yes, this, this is a, maybe a follow-up project. <laughs> um, how exactly did they do that? That seems like an awful lot. Um, so I start wondering about the underlying methodology of exactly how they ran those tests and um, how they came up with that result. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think that sounds fishy. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chef? 
Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, a really nice talk. Um, so mm -hmm. in, I, I had a question that's a little bit related to Ramesh's. Uh, you can either change the analysis path that you're looking at to test for things like non-Gaussian entity or uh, things in your model that might be uh, assumed but not real. The, in the Event Horizon Telescope, we took this tack of, of aggressively interrogating our entire system by throwing at it huge amounts of synthetic data uh -huh. that, that were engineered to probe for weaknesses. So we would say, well, imagine that you know, you're seeing something strange. So for example, in the most extreme case, a snowman, Frosty the snowman in the center of the galaxy. You know, would you be able to recover Frosty? But Frosty is just a, uh, a proxy for weird things in, in the case of your talk, non-Gaussianity. Mm -hmm. and, and in that way, we were able to push through the whole pipeline and, and test for these things. And when we knew there was something in the data, absolutely, and we didn't find it, then we knew that our pipeline was insufficient. So that's more of a forward-looking right. path as opposed to a changing your pipeline with the real data to look for things that might be uh, you know, different from your conception. I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. contrast the, the forward-looking method versus the more the receiving method. Right. That's no. That, thank you for that. And that that's a potential uh, uh, follow up. Is is um, because one of the things that I'm uh, just to just to I'm going to ask in a second if I've got the forward looking versus retrospective right. But um, one of the things that I think is important is the the way that like just data analysis methods can can reveal these kinds of dis discrepancies in the first place if they're done well enough. Um, and so let me make sure before I answer that I've got the the difference between you know the sort of retrospective and forward looking um, correct. So the retrospective analysis might be to say, well, we've already made these model assumptions, or we've already assumed that the data follows a certain distribution, and so we're going to go back and probe what it would have looked like if this existing model um, were wrong, right, or something like that. Whereas the forward looking um, testing would be to say, okay, well, we're gonna we're going to look at the at the at the uh, you know at the EHT or at the interferometers and just throw a whole bunch of uh, weird anomalous data in there and see if that they actually if there's something wrong if it actually gets picked up right if it can actually be detected is is that generally the distinction? Yeah, I I, I think that's generally the distinction. Yeah, I think you've got it right. Okay, so yeah, and I I think that that's. Um, so the distinction that so I, th I think that's exactly that's exactly right. And there's also I mean um, the that that's one of the important distinctions to make in terms of um, testing what what you might call testing the the model assumptions versus testing the the data analysis right or the data detection. Um, the worry would be. Um, and maybe you can tell me why I shouldn't be worried about this. The worry would be if there were a form of model dependence that made it very difficult to pick up um, an error in terms of, uh, in, in the situation that you're describing, right? So that to me would be the worry is if there was a, if there was a, a model assumption that was being made um, that made it sort of difficult, no matter how cleverly you uh, threw data at the system um, to pick up on an error that was uh, in the model assumption. I see. It, it, isn't this a way of determining how strong and useful your model is? I mean, if, in other words, if you're throwing known anomalies in right. and your pipeline is unable to recover them, then you know you have, in, in, the, in the words of the interferometer, you have maybe an invisible distribution because we, we sparsely sample the space. Mm -hmm. So there are some Fourier frequencies that we're insensitive to. There are some mm -hmm. places where our interferometer is just blind. Right. And, and so we want to probe the different structural maps we can make of a black hole that mm -hmm. might, have, might uh, violate some of our assumptions, but would go through the whole pipeline. 
and, and be undetected. Uh, for example, because our pipeline um, uses a sparsely sampled algorithm. Mm -hmm. So th this is why we went in, in more forward looking interrogative way. I see. So the idea would be if there's, uh, if there's something that you already know, right, I, th I think I'm just going to repeat what you just said, but just to make sure I got it. Um, if there's something that you already know is, is, uh, a pro is, is going to be a problem for uh, the detector system as you have it set up to pick up and then you send it through the pipeline, see if it's actually going to pick up on that anomaly. Um, and if it doesn't, then that's a known problem. If it does, then you know that um, the system is robust to that, at least to that set of anomalies. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting this works in all cases like for, for the CMB. I'm just right. saying that uh, we, we found this to be a useful tool to probe for weaknesses in the uh, the analysis chain. Yeah, that sounds fascinating because I think that that definitely does also, um, I'm very sympathetic to the idea, especially that that in the in the um, sort of in the pipeline of uh, that you're talking about, you can look for kind of, I think you put it exactly this way, engineering failures. Um, so you can say, okay, if there's a if there's a case where the system breaks down at a certain point, then you can target that point for um, for sort of repair or for making it broader or pick up on more more sort of a broader spectrum of of results or something. And I think that um, that's going to be, in a way, like I, I think that's that's going to be crucial, right? I mean, because that's that's a that's a fundamental part of um, designing the detector and the pipeline to be as open to potential disconfirming results or uh, then as it is to results that might tend to confirm the existing models. And so I think that's, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think that's a great idea. So I, I don't really have any, <laughs> um, I, I think that sounds amazing. In fact, uh, like I, I want to see the picture of Frosty though. That's, uh, yeah. thanks very much. Um, if I can just have a very quick follow-up. Um, it strikes me that the uh, the analogy the analogy with um, what they're doing with this the snowman and the EHT would the natural analogy would be if you did blind injections in yeah. LIGO with like sort of crazy signals to see whether the interferometer was capable of picking it up. And I just wondered whether you know whether they've done that because. Um, I've never read about them doing that, but it seems like a natural thing for them to do. I think it might depend on, so let me just say, say first of all, I, I don't know the answer to that question in detail, but I think it might depend on what, how, how far you want to take the idea of crazy. I think there, I, I do know of cases where there have been injections of signals that um, were against the you know, that were sort of counterfactual or that, or that were um, against the existing model. I do know they've done that. Okay. Um, so they've said like, let's say that the underlying signal is uh, like, doesn't, doesn't um, follow general relativity. Like that's happened in the recent, in the most recent um, observing run that they've, they've injected signals that are inconsistent with GR and that would actually be um, sort of indications of a different theory of gravity. And that's been a way to test whether um, whether there's a certain type of error being picked up, namely if there's a signal that is inconsistent with the model, is that signal being, this is this was exactly what uh, I think the last uh, Shep Dolman's question was about. Um, if there's a signal present that's inconsistent with the model, would the detectors pick it up much less the, you know, before we even think about the post data analysis, would the detector pick it up in the first place? And I think there is robust evidence that that, that is the case. Um, at least in the case of some sort of uh, signals that would be inconsistent with GR, um, I can't speak broad, more broadly than that. All right, I think uh, Tom is next in the queue. Oh, yes, thanks, Lee. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Um, love to just pr briefly pick up on the discussions you had around falsificationism and forwards backwards. And it's a long time since I read Imre Lakatosh, and I think probably Peter might want to pick us up on this. But it did, from what I recall, his kind of uh, kind of a little more realistic modification of falsification seemed to make sense here. And in terms of your, he's had these auxiliary hypotheses, these core ones, you kind of run with them. And it seemed to me that what you were describing as 
Gaussian, non-Gaussian background is a kind of perfect example of a Lakatoshian auxiliary hypothesis um, and might actually shine some light on taking that a bit further forward into how science really works or how the multiple ways in which we really do things. Absolutely, that's a great question. And, and so the, the, I, I love this question, especially because it allows me to just say, like, I, I have another hat, which is that I work on history of philosophy of science. And yeah, I, mean. I, I do want to say that, like, everything I said about falsification, there's a reason I said naive falsificationism, right? There's, <laughs> um, because, because what I was describing is not anywhere near what Lakatos or Popper, um, and they're very different, would have, would have said. And so you're, you're absolutely right to push me on that and to say, look, I mean, Lakatos had the idea of a, of a research program and of core um, assumptions and, and the auxiliary belt, the protective auxiliary belt. Now, I will note though, um, that Lakatosian idea, uh, he was partly talking about that as a, as a more robust and rigorous methodology for science, that there's a research program that can consist of sort of a set of core assumptions or, or views that if you give them up, you've basically given up your theory or your approach versus the what he calls the protective belt of auxiliary hypotheses that we can make in order to um, sort of test or expand or contract the theory in ways that nonetheless allow us to preserve the core. Um, but it's worth pointing out that that presentation of how science works um, gives rise to, to uh, some of the classic problems for scientific inference, like Harry Collins's problem of the experimenter's regress, right? So um, if you allow your auxiliaries to, to sort of, if you can just sort of allow any old auxiliary, right, um, then we get the familiar problems, the Duem Quine problem and, and so forth, right? That you can sort of tune your, um, your parameters to the point that you can get any, any result you want out of your system. Now, Lakatos thought that wasn't possible because he thought that there were certain views or, or claims that were just core to the program that you couldn't give up. Um, and so the question in this particular case would be, what are the assumptions, and I think this is a really good question, what are the assumptions that are core to the search for you know, background radiation of whatever kind? And what are the assumptions that we can kind of vary? Um, so for example, the idea of, um, isotropic radiation, that's something that clearly people can allow for multiple frameworks. There are some uh, types that are considered to be isotropic and some that are anisotropic, and that's allowed to vary without. Um, but then the question becomes, what is, what is it that you have to have um, in order to have a theory of this uh, phenomenon? What is it? And we might have to say, what is it that you have to have in order to have an inflationary theory um, in order to maintain the current paradigm to bring in another person. Um, and so these are all going to be really important questions for the philosophy of science aspect of all of this, absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Peter? Uh, just to continue the conversation that you were having, Lydia, with Shep, um, you know, one of the things that becomes more complicated with images is that there's so much, I mean, there's so much more information there in a way than a function of a, a you know than f of t of time, and then if you take the images and have them change over time, it gets even you know make them a movie, then it becomes even more complex. So in the case of the EHT, um, not only did we, as Shep says, try weird things like the, the snowman, but also we tried to take a variety of different images, like a disc, a crescent, a ring, and so on, and then say to the computer, you know, find the parameters that optimize across these different images. And in reproducing the best way possible, the, um, these synthetic starting points. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but now when we're working on making movies, we have an even more complicated problem because not only do we have um, images, which are more complicated, of course, even than f of t, but we have now a movie as a function of t, and there, you know, it's very hard to to even to characterize precisely how close a movie is to a, a synthetic movie, right? I mean, how and how how good our our recovery is. And we can, you know, we can try sampling it and taking snapshots, and I mean, there are various techniques that you can do, but it's a, it's an even harder problem. And then when you get to, 
uh, looking at real data over time, making an image, then you know the question of how we know how good our our ability to capture these things is is something that we're working on both with current EHT and for the future. That's 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 really fascinating. I mean, so so two things. Thank you for that. I um, first of all, there's a reason why I always have what I think of as the inherency slide, which is that um, you know my my. Uh, My sort of interest in this work partly comes from my interest in, you know, testing and, and investigation as a virtue in science, right, rather than simply confirmation. Um, and one of the things that I find when I look, the, the more I look at sort of LIGO and the EHT and the work that's being done, the more I find that there's already a really robust interest in, in you know, and I find these really cool things that researchers are doing in order to be able to test various counterfactual departures from the model assumptions. And so in a way it's kind of like, okay, this is already being done, but it's just worth pointing out how important that is to, um, to inference in this, in this domain, right? But um, exactly that kind of thing, like injections of weird data or um, trying to, to probe sort of counterfactual models is, is exactly the sort of thing that I think should be, uh, should be done, which I'm, you know, and I, I, so I think it's fascinating what's, uh, how creatively um, people are probing this. this. Um, the, so in, in actual answer to your point, um, one of the things that I think is, is potentially going to help, and I, I don't have any technical argument for this, only a kind of back of the envelope one, um, I would think that one of the ways to compare um, a movie, for instance, to the data or to observation in various ways would be to be able to do counterfactual um, judgments about, well, this is what the, the image and the movie would look like under different assumptions about the way that the system is evolving or under different assumptions about what's going on underneath. And then to be able to compare which one is the better fit. Um, having said that, I'm aware that you've done quite a bit of work in particular on how that's, those sorts of comparisons are more complicated than one might think. Um, so I'm a little hesitant to make that argument, but I, I would say that if that can be done, if these comparisons can be done, that would be one way to do it, would be to say, well, what would this look like if this weren't a stochastic process? Or what would this look like if the underlying uh, phenomenon looked like this or something like that? And then make kind of comparisons between um, uh, movies that are generated using different counterfactual assumptions. Um, it seems to me that that would be one way to go, but um, I'm sure there's also an argument for why that would be difficult. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Is it Aris? I've, I've seen your name written many times and I've just realized that I don't know yes. how to say it. <laughs> okay. Thanks Lydia for the fascinating presentation. Uh, as a statistician, uh, I was fascinated to see various statistical issues coming up, but I'll focus only on the non-Gaussianity because various fields discovered it 20, 30, 40 years ago. <clears throat> and it is fundamental to the discussion, uh, but moving away from it, if you can retain, uh, let's say the bell shape symmetry or the quadratic form that defines it, Extending these theories uh, is not going to be very difficult. We found out in economics, financial data, a lot of distributions were leptochaotic. Uh, and what that means is the conditional variance is no longer constant. So when you're looking at a map, things change as you move around. Yeah. And you have a conditional variance which changes with the condition information. But we know what to do there. Okay, yes, this is, okay, so this is, this is in fact, this is kind of the, the next step of, so thank you, thank you, yes, this is, um, I, this is great because I was going to ask you this question and now, so now I know the answer. <laughs> um, because I wondered, you know, um, there's always, there's always the, the possibility of extending a model in a way that captures what you need. Um, 
with the, while sort of accommodating for um, whatever departure it is that you've got, right? So for instance, this idea that uh, we have to assume that the microwave background is Gaussian in order to have it be totally characterized by the power spectral uh, density. Um, well, maybe, or maybe there needs to be some form of approximation that allows for that um, even, even while you're able to vary the, uh, uh, to, to pick up some divergences from Gaussianity, right? So if you can still make the model work and you can still have the, the energy completely characterized in that way, um, and what you're saying is that maybe there's some sort of encouraging news from, from other fields that, that this was possible um, in, in yes. their case. Yeah. I published extensively on the student state distribution uh, and, and a few other leptokertic distributions. Uh, and what it does yeah. is keeps the bell shape, keeps the linearity, which we need in all kinds of contexts here, uh, but it changes the condition of variance. Uh, and it complicates things slightly, but I suspect the geometry of these maps will not change drastically. Okay. That's very interesting. So what may happen then is simply a um, sort of a model that can accommodate certain yes. departures within a certain tolerance. Yes. Um, that's uh, you extend the original model by adding, let's say a few more parameters. But if you go in the direction of, uh, let's say, approximating or extending the Gaussian distribution using Hermit polynomials, you're going to get into trouble. You're going in the wrong direction. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Um, okay, well, if nobody else has a question, I'll put myself in the queue now. Um, so I don't have a very well-formed question. I'm just sort of trying to understand sort of the sort of central claim towards the end about um, the catalogs constituting a kind of rich framework for testing. Um, and I'm trying to understand what exactly um, that, that claim amounts to. So, um, I mean, it could be that this is, it's just that this catalog is sort of a rich source sort of of sort of past data that can sort of, you can go back to um, but I thought maybe you were trying to say something slightly more substantial than that. And so I'm just trying to get a grip on exactly what it is. So if you could maybe talk a little bit more about it, that'd be great. Yeah, so so um, yeah, thanks for pushing pushing into that that theme because I think that's it's uh, important. I mean, so the catalogs that I'm thinking of are partly the the catalogs of the observing runs, right? The LIGO cat and Virgo catalogs. And those include a lot more information um, than data, right? So there's there's some of what's in the catalog is data, um, but some of it is also includes like estimates of values for the uh, parameters, probabilistic information, um, sort of charts of like systems that are considered to have been detected, um, and then in the case of gravitational wave background, you know there's there's uh, parameter values again, but then also um, there's information about the models that are used. There's information about the sort of underlying picture of the uh, gravitational wave uh, background that's um, that's been inferred from the observing run. So for instance, right now uh, in the latest um, observing run that was just, just now reported, they said, well, we didn't pick up on um, background radiation, but we were able to put certain limits on um, on some of the parameters or on some of the, the system features. And so that was still important. That's still interesting information. And so I think that one of the, the, the sort of first point that I would want to make is that these catalogs are, are sometimes thought of as, as just kind of reports of data or, report, or direct reports of observation. And they have a lot more than that already in them, right? There's already some of this probabilistic information, model information, um, Yes, someone uh, Nils is saying in the chat. This sounds a lot like uh, Nora Bo Boyd's work, and that's that's absolutely right. This is I, I should have mentioned that. This is um, these sort of catalogs are are much more much richer than than you might think just from the name. Um, and I think that then we can extend this from the work of of uh, I'll just keep calling him Boucher uh, and 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 his colleagues. 
um, because one of the things that they're pointing out is that precisely because these catalogs contain so much information about the model and about inference, um, you can sort of, it, it also contains information about counterfactual dependence. So if we assume this model, then we will get this, um, this prediction. And so if you vary one, then you can actually test the other if you have a, a rich enough sort of alternative model or testing model, right? So you can say, hey, well, what if, what if we had observed this data, but we had a different view of the underlying phenomenon or we had a different model assumption, um, then what would happen? And um, my point is that the catalogs are so well constructed that it's a relatively quick move to do that um, because you, there's so much information already contained there about these counterfactual dependencies and prediction that you can really just sort of build like a, somebody, not me, could build a computer program to go through and, and sort of test various counterfactual assumptions and model dependencies. And so it seems to me that that would be a really, and, and I suspect that people honestly are already, well, I know that Boucher et al are already doing this. And I would think that that would be a, I suspect that people are already doing this in LIGO. I just don't know, I, I'm not aware of exactly who, but, um, but, but it seems to me that this would be um, a cool way of, of kind of making the most of what's already there. Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, are there any final questions? Just a quick, quick, um, okay. really question of detail. Um, at some point, you were talking about uh, uh, Boucher and co-workers um, coming up with uh, what they considered a better fit of the data, starting from an assumption of a, a specific uh, non non Gaussian uh, assumption, right? So, but. The, that set off a kind of alarm because you, you would expect that there's always going to be some specific model that will fit the, the data better because normal data is just noisy if you allow yourself to look through the entire parameter space. So, so I'm sure they had much more to say about why this might be good evidence in favor of non-Gaussianity, but I was, I was hoping you could just say a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that that's right. I mean, so... Um... They're very careful, as you might imagine. Um, and I'm partly going off of their uh, report of their paper in a blog post. So they're probably even less careful there than they are in the paper. Um, but uh, what they argue is that there is a better fit um, of their model than the uh, hierarchical ordering model in standard inflationary cosmology. Now, what they don't do is say, we've found evidence against the standard model of the standard inflationary model of cosmology, right? You never find them saying that. The only question that they, that they report on is, have we found discrepancies from the Gaussianity of the sort of underlying radiation? That's all they talk about. And so I think they're very aware that um, they haven't in fact found <laughs> evidence against, like it's not strong enough to say that they found evidence against the inflationary model. Um, I think partly for the reasons like the ones that you're bringing up and partly for the reasons like what Aristanos was saying earlier, um, you know, it's entirely possible that the inflationary model can be uh, tweaked in order, or tweaked is maybe a simplifying word, but can be changed um, in order to accommodate uh, these non-Gaussian entities and then you wouldn't really have the same problem. Um, they're just reporting on, you know, well, we were able to find a better fit of our model when we searched throughout the parameter space um, than a standard sort of hierarchical ordering model from inflationary cosmology. How strong that evidence is in favor of any particular claim, I think, is something that they leave open for reasons exactly like the ones that you're, you're raising. I think that's right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, then maybe we can thank Lydia again. Thank you guys. Thanks very I'd much. I'd like to see the, the slides or paper if you have it. Absolutely. Yes, I'd, I'd absolutely. Um, I, will, I will send them. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.